All right, options traders, listen up. I want to tell you a bit about public.com. But first, have you ever actually thought about all the fees you're paying to trade options? Aside from the regulatory fees, there are commissions, and most platforms charge per contract fees too. That's what makes today's sponsor, public.com, so interesting. Public doesn't charge commissions or pre-contract fees. And in an industry first, they offer a rebate of up to $0.18 per option contract traded. Check it out. If you trade 1,000 option contracts on public, you'll get up to $180 in rebates. If you trade 10,000 contracts, you could earn almost $2,000. More importantly, the rebate means you can maximize your profits and minimize your losses. So to recap, no commissions, no per contract fees, and up to $0.18 on every contract traded. See why NerdWallet recently awarded public five stars for options trading and start earning up to 18 cents per contract traded only at public.com. Paid for by Public Investing. Options not suitable for all investors and carry significant risk. Full disclosures and podcast description, U.S. members only. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Investing Unscripted, where we ask the hard questions about investing. I'm Jason Hall, joined as always... Wait, almost always, Jeff. Did we finally nail that down? Yes, joined almost always. The voice of the people, Jeff Santoro. Hey, buddy. Hey, how you doing? I'm good, and I'm excited because we've got a great guest lined up for this show. The Berthar ha- Berkshire Hathaway annual meetings coming up in about six or seven weeks. Always uh, a lot to talk about when we get to that. Got somebody coming on that I interviewed a couple of years ago, wrote one of the very few definitive books on Warren Buffett and Warren Buffett's investing. Robert Hatcher. We're going to talk to Robert in just a second here, but first, Jeff, do a little bit of housekeeping. Yep. So normal housekeeping announcements for everyone. Thanks again to those who've been reviewing and rating the show. That really helps everyone find our uh, podcast. Uh, I learned this week, Jason, that you can actually edit an old episode rating on a review on pod- Apple Podcasts. Someone came back and updated their earlier review and said that they were happy that we, we were still doing a good job. So <laughs> we, we pleased the customer many months ago and he's still pleased. So that was kind of cool. But if you could take a moment to give us a rating, give us a review, we really appreciate that. Um, and that's it. I'll keep the housekeeping short so we can uh, get to our interview. I want to add one thing onto that. I, I think it's, it's kind of an improvement. We had a reviewer recently who pointed out that we were improving. And of course, we interpreted that to mean that we were good, but just getting even better. This is even better than that. This isn't somebody that was surprised. This was somebody that was pleased. So yeah, I'll, t- I'll take he, the, I'll take He that. said he, uh, he hoped we get re-upped for season three. So there we go. Well, <laughs> I, I got a good feeling with um, getting great people, great guests like Robert Hagstrom on. That's going to help. Robert, how are you? Great. Uh, Jason and Jeff, great to be with you. Thanks so much for the invitation. Yeah, really happy to have you on. So for those that don't know, Robert Hagstrom authored The Warren Buffett Way one of two or three books that are really definitive books on Warren Buffett and Warren Buffett, the investor. Robert, I was lucky enough to have a uh, conversation with you a couple of years ago, right before the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. A lot has happened since, since then. And the one thing that's really exciting that is about to happen, so the timing just kind of worked out pretty good, what's going on with the Warren Buffett way that we want to start off with? Well, thanks, guys, and and I am I am excited about the the new book. It is it, it actually I guess would rank as the fourth edition. The first one came out in '94, which was the very first book, uh, Roger Lowenstein's book. I don't know if you count his book as one of the great yeah. books, but Buffett: The Making of American Capitalist, which I thought was the best biography, came out shortly after mine. And and then we did a second edition in '04 and a third edition and 14. And while he came back and said, you know, would you do the 30th anniversary edition? I said, well, what are we talking about here? The fourth edition. And they said, no, we want to make this a Wally investment classics. And and when they said that, that, that meant a lot to me because I thought Warren, uh, and the book on Warren deserved to be, you know, in a, in a library shelf that included, you know, we're talking about some of the great investment books, you know, the common stocks and uncommon profits by Phil Fisher. Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, Where are the Customer's Yachts, great book, Battle for Investment Survival, Super Money, which is one of Warren's you know, favorite books, The Alchemy of Finance by Soros, Vogel on Mutual Funds, Warren Love, Vogel. And so it, it would rank into that library. And I thought, 
I thought a book on Warren Buffett definitely deserved to be there. It, it'll be in print 50 years from now. And that was the catch, you know, the idea that somewhere down the road, there'll be a college student, not unlike Warren Buffett, you know, trying to figure out things. And there may be a dusted copy in the back of the library still in print. And I thought, yeah, that was it. So the idea to wrap it up here was that we would take the best of the Warren Buffett way, the best of the Warren Buffett portfolio, which talks about concentrated low turnover portfolios and the best of the money mine which I wrote a few years ago, which was not a method book. It was more of a philosophical book. And, and so- Mindset book. Yeah. It, it, so it's a compendium, if you will, mm -hmm. of all three books. And, and I think it turned out pretty well. Warren has seen it. Uh, he, he's pleased. And he's very pleased that the book is going to be reprinted and, and stay in print. So all is well in Omaha. Robert, let's, before we get into the topic at hand, Warren Buffett, your book, uh, some of the things from, from the book, the process of writing it, how you've seen Buffett evolve, how you've evolved. Let's, let's lay your background on what your history is. Um, what's your origin story? How did you come to yeah. investing? Yeah. <laughs> and that and then le lead you to write one of the definitive Warren Buffett books. Yeah. If, if you, you know, if you believe this story and I assure you it's true, you would say there's no chance in hell that Robert Hagstrom would have ever written a book about Warren Buffett because I had no starter. <laughs> I was not at the, at the start line when the gun went off. It was really haphazard. I, I was a political science major in college, went to Villanova University and did my undergraduate graduate in political science. Never took an economics course, never took a finance, accounting, anything. And I actually um, I had done some writing in college. I wrote for the Villanova and started the Libertarian Society. That was my great claim to fame. And uh, I had interviewed some politicians and after graduation decided to go to Washington and I wanted to be the next Woodward Bernstein. You know, I, I wanted to be kind of an investigative journalist, if you will, and spent about three months there and was so disgusted with the place. I immediately ran home with my tail between my legs, went back to the local newspaper, the suburban Wayne Times and said, boy, I'd love to have a job as a writer, a columnist, if you will. And they said, we can't afford to pay you. But if you go out and sell quarter page ads on a newspaper, uh, maybe we'll let you do a column once a month. And so, you know, right hand to God, I walked up and down the main line, Route 30, outside of Philadelphia, banging on doors saying, would you like to buy a quarter page ad in the newspaper? And, you know, nine out of 10 said no. Walked by a place called Lake Mason, Woodwalker, members of the New York Stock Exchange. Had no idea what that meant. I thought maybe it was a law firm or an accounting firm. And I, and I, I swear, I almost walked right by. But I said, no, you promised you'd bang on every single door, walked in, may I see the manager? They took me back. I said, you know, I'm Robert Hagstrom, uh, worked for the Suburban Wayne Times. Would you like to buy a quarter page ad in the newspaper? He said, no, would you like to be a stockbroker? <laughs> and it was 1983, which was right there at the beginning of the, uh, of the bull market. Yeah. And, uh, well, for we those that don't know, let me, let me say this as well, that just for those that don't know, Leg Mason's one of the most well-regarded value investing shops yeah. uh, in the world, yeah. right? Yeah. And that, then that was helpful in itself, but you know, I, I was dating a, a young woman at the time that I was hoping would become my wife. And I thought to myself, she may be a little more impressed with a stockbroker, which is what we were called in those days, that a quarter page <laughs> ad and a salesman went into training three weeks and was totally clueless. I mean, they did the value line investment survey, all these great value investors from Lake Mason. And all they did was talk numbers and balance sheets and income statements. And I was totally lost. And, and the Thursday night of the third week, we were going to leave the next day. I had it in my mind. I would resign. The trainer said, uh, the, the trainee, Laura Lane, wonderful woman said, listen, I have a photocopy of a Berkshire Hathaway and a report, which I'd never heard of, written by a guy named Warren Buffett, which I had never heard of, and said, I want you to read that tonight, come back and discuss in the morning. Took it to the hotel room, opened it up, was instantly depressed. There's no tables, no photographs. You know, it's just 20 pages <laughs> of Warren talking. And it was epithenic. It was, you know, the, the proverbial light bulb went on. It was an epiphany because what he began talking about was this woman, Rose Blumpkin, who started a Nebraska furniture mart and then talked about Chuck Huggins at Seeds Candies and Jack Byrne at Geico, Stan Lipsy at, at uh, the Buffalo Evening News. And he spent the whole, whole, you know, shareholder report talking about companies, their businesses, their products and services, and the people that ran them. And I said to myself, oh, this is what investing is, you know, and, and in that, in that instant moment, the numbers, you know, grew flesh and, and muscle and blood. And, and I went back in and I said, okay, I got it figured out. And I went into production and I just imitated him. Uh, you know, I decided I'd just buy great companies. I got every Berkshire Hathaway in report, read it all, every, in, every company that he bought, I had the end report. And I was like a kid following a ball player. Whatever he did, I did. And uh, 
So that's that's how I got you know baptized into the Warren Buffett mafia, if you will. Hey everybody, we'll be right back, but first a word from our sponsors. FinChat.io is the complete stock research platform for fundamental investors. They have all the standard financial data on more than 100,000 stocks globally. But beyond that, they have company-specific segment and KPI data on more than 1,500 stocks. Want to see Netflix's average revenue per member over the past 10 years? FinChat's got it. Do you like to track YouTube's advertising? They've got that too. Want to see how much of Celsius's revenue comes from Costco? You guessed it. They've got it. The breadth of FinChat's segment and KPI data is truly one of a kind. I use FinChat all the time, and I love it, especially for checking out the KPIs of all the stocks in my portfolio. To get 15% off any paid plan, go to finchat.io slash unscripted. That's finchat.io slash unscripted to get 15% off any paid plan today. The link will be in the show notes. You know, it, it's it's funny you tell that story, Robert, because I've I've only read the last handful of years letters because I've I'm a little late to the game here. Yeah. But this year's letter jumped out to me for what sounds like the same reason that that one jumped out to you. His way of telling the story of what has happened with his company through the yeah. eyes of a shareholder. Sure. And sure. it was just it was just such a nice reminder yeah. that you know intellectually, I think I understand that we're buying little pieces of companies, yeah. but it's so yeah. easy to lose sight of that. And the yeah. way he writes kind of always pulls you back into that. So it's just interesting. I, I can totally resonate with how that might've yeah. impacted you. Yeah. We'll have to get you the 1965 through the 2023 annual letters. I think they've got them up to 2020 now on Amazon and, and, and it really is, it's great reading. I mean, now I think I counted, it's almost a thousand pages of a chairman's letter and you could not, you know, do Moby Dick or, you know, War and Peace, or you could do Warren Buffett. And, and after a thousand pages of Warren Buffett, you've got a pretty good idea of how investing works. He, he's a great writer. J- just for edification, Carol Loomis, who uh, was the editor of Fortune magazine and a dear friend of Warren, is his editor. And he could not have picked a better editor because, uh, you know, I have editors and believe me, they always make me sound much better than I actually am. So he Yep, Warren like agreed. Bradley getting Carol Lewis <laughs> to be his editor. You know. Not to fast forward too much, but then yeah. you would spend roughly a decade from reading that first yeah. Warren Buffett shareholder letter, building your career, becoming established, finding yeah. your own way as an investor. Um, bridge that gap that 10 years mm-hmm. between when you started, when the Warren Buffett way first edition yeah. was published. How did you come to write the Warren Buffett way? Well, and that, you know, it's a story in itself, you know, back in the days in the eighties, stockbrokers, we weren't fee-based managers. EF Hutton had not come out with a wrap fee on, on separately managed accounts. And so we were all commission guys and, and gals. And so your, your paycheck was based upon what you bought and sold. And my manager came up to me one day, you know, me following the Warren Buffett math process. And he said, you know, Robert, you could double your salary if you ever sell anything. And I said, well, that's not how this works. I mean, we're. We're compounding, you know, we're compounding stocks over time. And look, I bought this two or three years ago. Look what it's worth now. And he goes, no, but you're going to starve. If you don't ever sell something and buy something, you're going to starve to death. So I left the sell side. I think this was 87, 88, went to the buy side, worked for a, a, a bank there in Philadelphia, Fidelity Bay, went into the CFA program, got my CFA, left the bank, went to a small investment counseling firm. And it was 1992 that the CFA Institute came out with what was called the performance presentation standards and said, uh, in so many words, if your decision-making process is not 100% yours, it's not considered, uh, uh, discretionary. It's considered non-discretionary and therefore it's not your track record. You can't publish it. And our investment counseling firm was very much like a trust company. I mean, the client had a favorite stock. He got into the portfolio. There was tax issues. We'd work with them on it. If the, the son wanted a stock, you know. So we did not qualify for track record. And I said to my partners, I said, we're in a whole lot of trouble. I said, we no longer have a track record. And I said, we've got to get a track record. And they said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, let's do this Buffett thing. And of course they were kind of like up to here with me and Buffett, <laughs> father, you know, you and Buffett were sick of it. And the deal was, you know, write a white paper or marketing paper on it. And, uh, if you can sell it and enough people sign up, we'll make that our discretionary track record. So the Warren by the way, actually started in 1992. As I, you know, kind of a white paper on Warren Buffett, how to think about stocks and businesses, how to think about portfolio management. And that, and that was the genesis of the book. Somebody got a hold of the white paper and said, you know, this would make a, a, a interesting, interesting, I mean, 
I got a hold of the white paper and said, this would make an interesting book. I had thought, you know, well, gosh, I don't know if I got a book in me. I swear to God, I went to Sampson Street in Philadelphia. There's a how to do it bookstore. And it was like, you know, how to fix your roof, how to fix the engine, how to repair the refrigerator. And one of the books said, how to write a nonfiction book. I said, well, that's kind of very skinny. And I opened it up. The first page said, have you ever write, written a 20 page term paper? And I said, well, yeah. And I said, have you ever, you know, gotten a B or better? And I thought, well, in my college career, there's got to be a couple of Bs that I could point to. And then it said, you know, could you write eight term papers in a year? I said, well, heck, I used to write three in the last week of the semester. Surely I get in there. So it's like, kind of like they laid it out in such a way that writing a nonfiction book, this is different than fiction, but writing a nonfiction book is really nothing but a string of term papers. And the first chapter is what you're going to tell them. And the last chapter is what you told them. Right. So the middle tell them what you're going to tell them, tell yeah. them, tell them what you told them. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I had, I had a book outline. I had a sample chapter. I took it to a couple of publishers. Every one of them said, Robert, we are not interested in a book about Warren Buffett. We want a book written by Warren Buffett. Right. 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 Of course, he always flirted with the idea that he would do it, which he never did. And, uh, with this great guy, Miles Thompson, who was the beginning editor at John Wiley said, you know, I'll take a shot on it. And uh, he published it and uh, boy, it, uh, talk, another story is how it became a New York Times bestseller, but it began as a marketing piece, how to build a track record. And John Wally took a shot on it and it became their very first New York Times bestseller. So Good. Robert, I've, I've heard that once the book was written or as you were writing it, it, it got reviewed by or had to kind of get cleared by Warren Buffett. Oh, yeah. like, what, what's the background story there? All right. So. Warren's deal was this. So I actually, I sent him this letter. What, this is before email, is the, right? each, each, each of the shareholder letters, these are copywritten, yeah, they're copyrighted, I, right? These are copyrighted. Jason, you're, you're right on cue, and which is, I, I had decided that I would take the quotes from his letters and have him speak through the book as if Warren was, you know, describing to the reader what was going on. Of course, then I knew I had to have copyright permission. I sent him a letter and I said, you know, key with Plaza, Omaha stamp on the envelope, sent it U.S. mail. And about three weeks later, here it comes back. And it said, dear Robert, thank you very much for your letter. Blah, blah, blah. And he said, I can't give you copyright permission just yet. Well, being in sales, I knew not just yet. I mean, that's not a no. It's just, what do we got to do here? And right. The door, push the door open a little yeah. further. Now. And he said, <laughs> I've, you know, I've seen some bad experiences with investment books. I don't want a book that's the get quick, rich schemes of Warren Buffett or how to make a billion like Warren Buffett. The deal was this. I had to send him every chapter and, uh, at the end, if he was okay with it, he wanted to know how the book was going to be titled, how it was going to be marketed. He said, at the end, if I'm satisfied, I'll, I'll give you copyright permission. At that time, his secretary was a woman by the name of Debbie Pazanic. Debbie Pazanic is his He's secretary. Still his secretary. That, she yeah. must've been 17 years old at the time. <laughs> and I would send a letter in the mail and she would call me back and say, Robert, you're okay. Keep going. Well, this is what chapter one, chapter two, you're okay. Keep going. Never made a change. Right. And while he was saying, where's the copyright permission? Where's the copyright permission? I said, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Don't worry. We got to the end of the book and he said, okay, you know, here it is. What's the title? Miles said the worm by the way. And I said, fine with me. This is how we're going to market it. And, and he gave me that copyright permission did not change one word of the book. Now that's not to say the book is perfect. It wasn't, but. He didn't go in and make any things and he didn't need to, because basically all I did was take what he had written right. and organized it in such a way, dividing it into business tenants, financial tenants, management tenants, value tenants, and then took all the stocks that he bought and just lined them up and, and it spoke to him. So I didn't invent anything. I didn't exaggerate anything, but boy, I was damn lucky um, that he gave copyright permission because the book would have been a success without, I mean, having more and speak through the book. Yeah. Uh, was a well, you time. delivered a little bit what what those other publishers said they wanted, you know? Yeah, in some ways. Yeah. I yeah. mean, they got, they got Warren speaking through the book, although it wasn't a book by Warren, but it got as close as any book could have gotten to them by having him speak through the book. One of the things that I appreciate about your book, and there's a little bit, you mentioned the Lowenstein book as well. Mm -hmm. That's another, the, I think your, your book and Roger Lowenstein's book are the two by far uh, without par um, mm -hmm. on Buffett. The the chapter chapter two or three I can't remember which it is that talks about the people who influenced yeah. Buffett and you have his father right deep deep influence and then you have some of the greatest investors of the twentieth century as well that influenced him yeah well 
in the first edition, you know, it was very simple. It had to be Ben Graham, right? So, you know, Warren read The Intelligent Investor. He was, you know, 18 years old or 19 years old at the time, 1950. It wasn't his birthday until August. And he had, his dad was a stockbroker and Warren was all over the map buying stocks. He even did technical analysis. He was all over the chart and he read The Intelligent Investor and the whole idea of margin of safety. Buying stocks at 50 cents on the dollars really resonated to him. He thought that Ben Graham was dead, but then in looking him up, he found out that in fact, he was a professor at uh, Columbia University, then discovered there was a book called Security Analysis that was written with David Dodd. He was also a professor at Columbia and uh, he, you know, within a month, uh, you know, had gotten accepted and was on a plane going to New York and was, you know, on campus in the fall of 1950. So Graham, huge influence, which he has repeated many times over. I had also had thought because Warren had, had tipped his hat that he had met um, Phil Fisher, who had written Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits, and said that he had an influence. And I think at the time he said, and this was in the 1960s, I picked up a magazine article written. He said, I'm 85% Graham, 15% Phil Fisher. So I went and read Phil Fisher's book. I actually ended up into a, uh, a uh, letter. Uh, we became very friendly, exchanging letters. Phen- phenomenal man. I, I read um, Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits, and it was the bridge. It kind of gap between Graham doing this quantitative hard book, low PE, and Fisher doing the fundamental side, what makes for good business, what makes for good management. Right. So I said in the book, I said, yeah, it's Graham, but in addition, you got to take a look at Phil Fisher. And, and so I went through all of Phil Fisher's, his 12 points and, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, it's like 20 points and I count. And so I, the first edition was that. The second edition, actually before that one, we did the Warren Buffett portfolio, uh, had Charlie in there. I hadn't included Charlie too much in the first edition of the book. In the second edition of the book, I really plowed into Charlie and said, you know, Charlie, and because Charlie was not a Ben Graham guy. He was, you know, he had run his yeah. own investment partnership and he was by a bet. You know, if you read the, if you read the tribute this year, mm-hmm. Warren said, you know, Charlie was the architect of Berkshire. You know, I was just a general contractor and, uh. That's true because uh, Charlie was never a big, you know, he respected Ben Graham, but didn't buy into the low PE, low price to book type stuff. He was more of a Phil Fisher guy. So I gave Charlie a lot of air time in the book, deservedly so, in the future books. And then when we did the money mine, Jason, you might remember, it was, I, I figured that what we missed, we mentioned his father, Howard Homan, Howard Homan Buffett. It was a congressman, stockbroker, and, and Warren said, the most important man in my life, you know, other than Ben Graham, the most important man in my life. And so I started drilling down on Howard Buffett and, uh, you know, went through the newspapers and all my own stuff like that. And Roger gave me a great idea. Roger said that it was uh, uh, the link to Graham was basically having Warren learn the Emersonian philosophy from his dad that made possible his connection to Graham. So I went, Emerson, well, I remember Ralph Waldo Emerson. And so you go right. to his famous essay called Self-Reliance and there's Buffett. If you read Self-Reliance, you go, there's Warren Buffett. So you can imagine here's this nine, 10, 11 year old guy. He worships his dad. There's no TV, you know, sometimes radio. His dad's a libertarian. And uh, all he's doing is talking about Emersonian philosophy. So now the book today starts with Howard Home and Buffett, then goes to Graham and says, no, it's not Graham, it's Phil Fisher, it's the additive. And then it finishes up with Charlie, justifiably so, that Charlie, you know, raised the bar for Warren, uh, not only in buying better businesses, but, and also obviously in the legal, because he was an attorney, but, you know, the whole idea of the psychology of his judgments was huge. I had written about um, the lattice work of mental models, a book now called um, Investing the Last Little Art. And, uh, you know, Charlie's a polymath. And so Charlie is kind of the end and of that chapter of the education. So you really begin to come away with Warren's influence. This is that Ben Graham, Phil Fisher, and Charlie Munger all collected together. And what a power, what a powerhouse. You know, if you followed those four guys, you know, you would definitely succeed. So you you mentioned the tribute that Buffett wrote in this year's annual letter about Charlie Munger. I don't, it jumped out to me as being, I, I guess that was um, more credit to Berkshire's success than I would have expected Buffett to give. And it got me thinking about their relationship and the way they played off of each other. So I'm just curious as someone who's obviously spent a lot more time thinking about Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger than I have, did that surprise you? Or do you think that that's an accurate 
portrayal of of how Berkshire kind of came to be. And maybe it's just the greater media that has always given Buffett most of the credit, even if it was equally split or maybe even more Charlie than Warren. Um, I I was I was very much surprised at, at not surprised, but can I say surprisingly pleased? Yeah, at, that Warren basically said it was chocolate, you know. And then you go back to Seize Candy. There was the pivot in 1972 when they bought this chocolate candy company on the West Coast. You know, it was three or four times multiple of book value. Warren says, I, you know, this looks very expensive to me. Charlie says, no, it's not. You don't get it. This is the business we want. It's a cash generation. And C's, you know, it was almost, and it was, you know, Warren begrudgingly, I mean, it was a $40 million purchase price. They had 10 million on the balance sheet. So it was 30 million to buy it. And even Warren tried to probably scale the deal by offering 25 million and they took it. And what happened over the next 20 some odd years was just phenomenal cash generation out of C's candy. So had Charlie not pushed him to buy C's, it would have been delayed, you know, not impossible, but it would have been delayed because you could look at what happened next, you know, Coca-Cola, you get into the American Express, and even some people say Apple today. Um, it, that's C's candies that, that Charlie said, Warren, pay attention to this, started everything. And that was the pivot. He pivoted from Graham, went into the better businesses, and the rest is history. Now, he made mistakes you know, buying airlines and, you know, stuff like that. But overall, he, he says even today, what I'd come away with, with Graham, there's only two chapters in the Intelligent Investor, chapter eight and chapter 20. Chapter eight is margin of safety and chapter 20 is how to think about work. It's, that's it. Yeah. In the 1992 annual report, he described value investing has nothing to do with price earnings ratios, price to book, dividend yields. You know, low P doesn't mean it's a value. Neither does high P. I mean, it's not a value. And really turned everybody upside down. It's introduced John Burr Williams, the dividend discount model, and says, I'm looking for coupon clippers. I want money coming in the door so I can buy more companies for Berkshire. That's Charlie. Charlie, these companies generate a lot of cash. He had already learned early on that buying stocks based upon Ben Graham's low PE didn't generate cash. They were capital intensive, low margin, headache companies. He's trying to build a conglomerate, but he didn't have any firepower from the companies that he was buying from Graham's methodology. But when he pivoted to Charlie, big gush, the, the money just gushed in. Well, and there's a, you know, there's a few things from that that it reminds me of. Um, num number one is, and I can't remember who it was that said it, but the, when the facts change, I change my opinion. And I, I think Warren, like Warren Buffett demonstrates mental flexibility, maybe more than any other investor that I can think of. Yeah. And his willingness and his reasoning behind investing in the airlines made sense that, that it had become a more consolidated industry and there was yep. opportunity. Yeah. And then, of course, everything that's happened since then has said, well, sometimes the facts may change and it not work out. But thinking about shifting away from that Ben Graham style, back when Graham and Dodd um, were professors at Columbia and before that, they had access to information, they had a competitive advantage to find those deeply yeah. discounted opportunities. Sure. And with quantitative computing and everything on the SEC website instantaneously available, yeah. we we don't as retail investors. That's we don't have the advantage of that information to find no. the, that deeply discounted value anymore, right? No. no. And having you know um, Charlie stand, and I can picture Charlie kind of standing behind him a little bit with that gruff look on his face, um, you know, just just constantly reminding him, Warren, your mind, your ability to find moats. Mm -hmm. That's a competitive advantage. Yeah. And Charlie's saying, sure, or Warren saying, sure, but you know what? I'm still not going to pay more than 15 times earnings. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. And yeah. kind of the combining of those, those, those yeah. strengths, not completely evolving from one thing to the next, but combining the taking away, like you said, those two chapters from, from, yeah. um, um, from Graham and combining that with how he could leverage that in the modern world. And then, and this is the last thing I want to ask you about on this before we start talking about the, the, the 12 tenets on investing. Um, one of the most powerful things he figured out, Geico, I think, opened his eyes to it, um, is the power of being able to use leverage in a smart way. You know, banking, the danger with leverage is you get a run and you're out of business. Yeah, yeah. In insurance, because that was, I believe, the first... I believe the first acquisition was the insurance company in Omaha. I can't remember the name. National, yeah, it was National Indemnity. Yeah. That that 
really, you know, he got a great education uh, from National Indemnity. But having said that, when he was in college doing his master's with Graham, he noticed that Graham had a huge position in Geico, which was right. always, and we talked about this in the book, was always kind of odd because it was not a classic value stock and, and by any stretch of the imagination. And Graham was very much, don't lose, don't lose, don't lose. And when you looked at Geico, you know, the, it was based more on the future of them selling agentless insurance at discounted prices, untested. So it really didn't fit. But he actually looked up. They were in Washington, D.C. He opts a train on a Saturday morning out of New York Penn Station, gets down to Washington, D.C., bangs on the door. Janitor answers the door. And Warren says, can I talk to anybody about this company? <laughs> Janitor takes him back, and it's it's uh, Lorimer Davidson, who was the CEO, and they spent three hours talking about insurance. So the, what they, he says, though, in the end of reports, and it's actually true, insurance companies are great investment vehicles. They're not always great investments, right? Yeah. You could screw up a, an insurance company pretty good, but for the time being, when, the, when the, the premiums are coming in, that's your float that you get to invest. So they are terrific investment vehicles. So Warren figured out real quickly. You know, I get a lot of cash that I get to invest in the market. And as long as we don't screw up the pricing and betting the risk, you know, I can, that's the leverage, right? That's, I can take other people's money that I don't have to pay them just yet and invest it in the stock market, earn an excess return up and beyond what I got to pay them when the claims come in. And, and that's how we levered it. And, and that's why the insurance business is the single largest, most valuable part for your Hathaway. Yeah, it, it, that's where the money for so much of the other investments have, sure. have come from. It's remarkable. 1, yeah, absolutely. So one of the chapters, maybe my favorite chapter is the, on the, the tenets of it. Well, I guess it's over a couple of chapters, the 12 tenets of investing. Yeah. I want people to read the book. I don't want to share all of them, but if you can talk a little bit about the, the tenets of investing, how you, the, your realization of these of central tenets that are in, in Buffett's process, yeah. Yeah. how you came, how you kind of came to that. Well, you know, and once again, Warren's, if you read all the Anna reports, you can start to write down how many times he talks about what makes for a good business. And then you write down how many times he talks about what makes for good management. And then you write down all the things that he says, these are the best financials. And, and those, in a sense, became the, the four buckets. And, and the last part is valuation. And that was uh, John Burr Williams' dividend discount model and Ben Graham's margin of safety. But, you know, he, was so simple. He goes, look, I don't buy a business I don't understand. I went, all right, simple and understandable. Two, uh, I like to buy, uh, you know, businesses that have a, had a consistent operating history. I don't like turnarounds. I want to know that you know what you're doing and you prove it, you know what you're doing. And so that was, you know, consistent operating history. And the third one, which is probably the single hardest thing, and Warren has said, this is where I make most of my mistakes, is long-term favorable outlook. And so th those were the three tenets. I got to be able to understand it. You've had to have a consistent operating history. And third, there has to be a favorable long-term outlook. Warren says of the mistakes that I made, the one that I most frequently made is not the price that I paid. I paid a good price. For it. it wasn't that management turned on me and, and ended up being, you know, evil allocators of capital. It is that I misjudged the long-term competitive nature of the business. Now he's good on modes, but the mistakes that that we've made and I've made and probably everybody else is that we didn't quite accurately calculate how long that competitive advantage period would last. And when you get that part wrong, uh, then things change pretty quickly. So that was interesting management, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of Phil Fisher in management, candor, you know, rational allocation of capital, things of that nature. Finance was, you know, very return on equity was more important to him than EPS growth. But, you know, you take owner earnings, which is adjusts for the capital investments. You need high margins. The other one I thought was really good, and he used it very early, was for every dollar reinvested in the company, it has to produce at least one dollar of market value. Well, that's, 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 you go back and that, that's actually, um, I'm trying to think it's uh, Al Rappaport creating shareholder value. That was the very beginning of companies that earn above the cost of capital increase intrinsic value. Companies that earn below the cost of capital destroy its shareholder value. So when you have a company that takes a dollar of investment in and creates more than one dollar of market value, clearly it's earning about the cost of capital. I mean, that's just a litmus test. If you take a dollar in and you're not earning at least one dollar of market value, then obviously you're destroying shareholder value. So Warren picked up that way before, you know, McKinsey and Stern Stewart guys were doing EBA and all that stuff. That was just a litmus test. He said, over time, I can figure out if it's a good business based upon what the market value is after they have invested all the money back into the company. And it was great. It was, it was a perfect. 
What's interesting to me with these tenants, you just explained some of them and they're very clear and easy to understand. And he's been writing annually and be doing interviews for decades. He's very upfront about his whole process. Why do you think that we've not seen anyone able to replicate <laughs> what, what Berkshire's done? Or, or are there people out there that you think have yeah. come close who maybe yeah. just don't get the headlines? Well, I, you, 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 this is something that I'm going to talk about at Berkshire this year. Uh, it was Charlie back in 2017. He said, if we're so smart, why are so many eminent places wrong? Why aren't we taught at universities? And why aren't we embraced by big money management organizations? There, there, there are a bunch of people out there. And, you know, they're well known, the Tom Russo's of the world, you know, Tom Gaynor at Markel is trying to do it. But if you look at a percent of the money managed uh, that is of a Buffett clan, if you will, or the Buffett way, however you want to decline it, describe it, it is minuscule based upon the amount of money that is being managed in this world. Let's, let's take the alternatives off the table, take venture capital, private equity, take that all off the table. If you think about it, it, it is it is less than one percent. It would be a fraction of one percent. And the question is why? And in the book, the new book, we actually track that down. And it, you know, uh, Harry Markowitz, fine young man, you know, brilliant, played the violin, great reader, and everything, liberal arts major, just like me, uh, decides he wants to do his graduate degree in uh, economics and finance at Columbia. I mean, at University of Chicago, ends up uh, writing a paper on risk and return and economics. And if you go back and look at the original paper, he said risk and return is uh, related. And of course it is, you know, the more return you want, the more risk you have to take. And the less return you want, it's probably the less re risk. So he had that part right. He said return is the dividend yield economic return. He said though risk though, I define as the variable, the variability of the return, the price return, which I deem to be undesirable. This is 1952. Right then and there, somebody should have stood up and said to him, you're wrong. The dissertation committee didn't say anything. His thesis advisor didn't say anything. In 1949, Intelligent Investor was written and said risk is margin of safety. Security analysis was in its third edition in 1951 and said risk is not price volatility. It is margin of safety. He cited John Burr Williams' book, Theory of Investment Value. In the preface, John Burr Williams said, it is buying something for less than it's worth based upon the cash flows. All right. So he said, okay, that's it. William Sharp shows up 10 years later. He jumps on board and says, yeah, based upon Markowitz, all these non-correlative trades you have to do, why don't we just come up with something that is singular? He got beta. So beta was risk. Nothing happened with this for 20 years. We get on the other side of the 73, 74 bear market. We blew up the money. Um, nobody, ben Graham had already retired. Uh, the guy that came in after him, I'm just having a senior moment. I'll think of him in a second, had retired. There was no value investing program at Columbia in 1974. The go-go stocks were all the big deal. Security analysis was not being taught anymore. We got to the other side of 73, 74, and there was a vacuum. Uh, Bill, uh, William Bernstein had written, you know, people were worried about their pensions. We blew up this money. Everybody was pissed off. And they said, what are we going to do? And a bunch of academicians who hadn't been heard of in 20 years said, hey, I got an idea. You know, this price thing, that's the evil. That's the demon. Why don't you put together portfolios that tamp down price volatility? Get a bunch of non correlative assets in your portfolio that reduce the risk of price variability, and you can get through a bear market like this. And they said, I'm in. <laughs> that's exactly what I want. And in 1982, when everybody came back, it was already the seeds that were planted. It was easily scalable. Everybody bought broadly diversified portfolios of non correlative securities and industries. And then on top of that, everybody began rushing for, uh, you know, short-term performance. Interesting, you go back and look at the risk tolerance exams, back then questionnaires, 10 questions, seven of them are about how do you feel about the bounciness of a stock price, which everybody says, I hate this. So you then figure out, okay, go to Thomas Toon's theories of scientific revolution. You have a paradigm, you know, which was, you know, the, what I call the, the high priest of modern finance, who were never investors, never owned businesses, had never been in the stock market, came up with a theory. And I got planted. And, you know, mm -hmm. they, they had more disciples that came in as dissertation guys who got their PhD. And all of a sudden you got this Leviathan that is called modern portfolio theory that seeks to defeat, you know, price volatility. And then Warren starts to vocalize his, you know, idea that that's not right. I'll do it the other way. But you know, we were so small, our number, we were outnumbered. Yeah. And today, you know, 
to pave to this day, people will prefer to have a smooth ride over the bouncing 15. And that's the world we're stuck in. And that's why, you know, active money management is in such dire straits. Money's leaving yet to go to alternatives, to venture capital, to quad driven, whatever it is. But the long only manager is a dying breed today, except I would argue the guys that do high active share concentrated portfolios are doing just fine. They just need to raise the banner a little bit more and get people aware that this is a viable strategy. It's just different than, than what has, you know, been part of this edifice for the last 40 years. I know that was long preachy, but I had to get that off my chest. No, it's where we're and, <laughs> and it, um, as you were saying it, it, I was reminded of some of the more chippier comments Charlie made over the last couple of years in, in meetings and on interviews. It seems like as time went on, he more than Warren, I don't know, just to me anyway, seemed to be a little bit more annoyed that yeah. everything yeah. that you yeah. just said is happening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he would throw these little barbs out there. Well, you know, and what, you know, if you go back to the Keynesian theories, he basically says, even the people at the original paradigm, so let's say you're, you're a PhD in, in modern portfolio theory, or you have a money management practice, $10 billion based on modern portfolio theory. Are you going to stand up one day and say, you know, everything that I've been teaching you and practicing to you is a bunch of bullshit. And I think we should do it differently. Of course. Right. Not. Right. You're not going to give up the ship. You're not going to give up your intellectual capital. You're not going to give up your paycheck, your mortgage to say everything that I've been doing is suboptimal. And you should do it like Warren Buffett does. Right. They'd have no business. They'd have yeah. no, these guys wouldn't be teaching classes. Hey, everybody, we'll be right back. But first, a word from our sponsors. Earlier in the show, you heard us talk about investing platform public.com. That's where you can trade options with no commissions or per contract fees. And you get a rebate of up to 18 cents per contract traded. NerdWallet recently gave public five out of five stars for options trading. If you want to see why, go to public.com and start getting a rebate of up to 18 cents per contract traded. Paid for by public investing. Options not suitable for all investors and carries significant risk. Full disclosures and podcast description, U.S. members only. Robert, one of the one of yeah. one of my favorite episodes that we've done, and something we is kind of a recurring theme here, is talking about the power of incentives. Yeah, sure. And <laughs> this is yeah. that's this is a textbook case of that. Yeah. Um, I think I also think it's remarkable too that finance and investing is one of the few studies, one of the few disciplines that the way that it is taught is completely separate from the way that it is actually practiced exactly. historically. It is remarkable. Yeah. It is remarkable um, yeah. that that's, that's the reality. Yeah. Uh, I think a good place to pivot from here is exactly this idea of taking, moving it from the, the page of the book, moving it from Buffett's annual letters to applying those lessons in the real world. And the two questions... Um, for you, I'll ask them together. How has studying uh, Warren Buffett affected you, both professionally as an investment manager, yep. and but also how you invest for yourself? Well, wh whatever I, I'm kind of like Warren, you know, you eat your own cooking. Whatever I do for my clients is what I do for myself, or whatever I do for myself is what I do for my clients. So there's no cross purposes. You know, 100% of my equity money is in my portfolio that that, that goes to my clients. Um, what has changed, I think, is, well, it's kind of, I feel like, you know, Don Quixote swinging at the windmills. You know, I, I've never met anybody who has ever disagreed with, I said, you know, this is this Buffett thing. This is what we do. And this is Warren Buffett. And I said, would you like to invest like that? You know, nine out of 10 people said, yeah, I'm in. Let's do this. And six months down the road, you know, eight out of nine have already lost their mind because we didn't own Bitcoin or we didn't own oil and all the- Wasn't exciting was enough. Yeah, wasn't yeah, the yeah, whatever well, the latest FOMO it, craze it, is. Kind of like the marshmallow test. You know, they needed that instant gratification. Yeah. Right, right. And and I said, you know, that's not how it works. I said, you know, we compound money over time. It's, you know, and, and people just can't do that. They just are mentally not wired. And by the way, in the 1980s, what came out then was uh, Tversky and Kahneman's prospect theory. And the, and the high priest of modern finance said, see, I told you, you know, when a price goes down, it has twice as much pain as when the price goes up a single, you know. And so they jumped on that. And people are all about that. I said, it's not the, you know, we've become a, we've become an, an investment community that knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. We're, we're, we're trading prices and we're not understanding where the value is. Now, I would say uh, we built a nice practice and it's not a big one. It's 5 billion, but, but we've got a good core of people that are business investors. And if you said to me, guys, who's the best investor that you can find? I said, find me a business owner. Find me a business owner so I can talk to him about how he runs his business and what's important to him and how he thinks about the future of his business. 
and I'll tell him that I'll run his stock money exactly the same way. Those are the best guys we've got and women. I mean, they go, I'm all in. That's what I want to do. But the people that can't make that connection that a stock is a business, as I did in 19, you know, 84 back then, they, they just lose their mind. I, I, I can't figure out how to solve that. So I'll, I'll pitch one to you. I thought maybe the way to do this, what does private equity have today? What, three trillion? And they have about a trillion in, in dry powder that they haven't yeah, invested. That's about right. All right. So private equity says, we're going to go in, we're going to buy a business, we're going to make it better. Now, Warren says, I don't want to buy a business, I have to make it better. I just want to have a good business. But basically, a private equity has got to be the sweetest deal ever. Never mind the payout, you know, what, what the incentives. We'll talk about that later. So every month I have to report my performance. Every quarter I have to report my performance. Every year I thought you're right. Yeah. So does private equity. But it's amazing. Their NAV never changes. When they invest the money, the NAV is like a dollar. And then like three months later, it's like 99 cents. And then, you know, six months later, it's about five. And then, you know, and so they never have the bounciness of their NAV in private equity because they're calculating the NAV relative to the economics of what they own. And then when they get their payout, year seven, you know, there's a big tail at the end and it goes up 50 to 100 percent. Well, this, it's, the, it's the benefit of um, not having to deal with the voting machine part of the exactly. cycle. Yeah. So, but people go, I love private equity. It never goes down. Well, I go, yeah, I love my portfolio. The economics have never gone down. But the prices are all over the place. And so right. private equity has got a winning hand that they don't have to play the, you know, they don't have to play the bouncy game. I'm trying to do the same thing the private equity guys are, but I'm not trying to buy bad businesses that need to turn around and replace management. That's hard. I'm just saying I'll, I'll do the same thing they're going to do. They're compounding money. Over time, I'm going to do the same thing, and I'm not going to charge you, you know, 1% and 2 and 20 or whatever the number is. You know, we're, you know, we're a cheap shop. And they go, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. I said, well, why don't you do that with your publicly traded securities? Why? Just because they have a quote, do you have to lose your mind just because there's a daily price quote? Why don't you just buy like a private equity guy? And they go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Of course, tomorrow they're CNBC's on and they've lost their mind again. And right. So, and right. It's hopeless. I, you know, we've been trying to do this for a hundred plus years and we're still, we still can't figure it out. It, it always seemed to me that as long as we're going to get, as long as we're, you know, we're going to keep living in a 24 seven news world, yeah. which we do, it, this will never be solved. You know, no. we, we would have to be in a world where you only get to see your stock price yeah. once a month or once every six yeah. months or whatever. Yeah. That'd yeah. be the only way out of it, but. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not a big proponent of tax, but I remember Charlie and Warren saying one way they'd fix it is they just you know, tax capital gains, short-term capital gains at 90%. Right. <laughs> you don't hold something for six months and you sell it at a profit. 90% is tax. Well, that, that changes that behavior pretty quick. Yeah. But that's Incentives. That'll never happen. You know, I'm, I'm right. not advocating that, but you you've got to find a way to make it painful for somebody to trade short-term. Yeah. And thus far, and what's all happened, you guys know it better than anybody, is we've just made the price of, of buying and selling go down and go down and go down. And, and as you make the price cheaper, it allows you to do it more often. Or the other way to do it is we should have raised commissions of this time and people would have traded less. There would have been no quad shops. <laughs> you know, they could have never, if, if right. commissions hadn't have been, uh, you know, you know, deconstructed in the 1970s, you know, there couldn't have been a quad shop that could have traded like they did. You know, they could have never it's, afforded it. it. it it's remarkable how something that has, has made the market so much more accessible to so many yeah. more people yeah. has also made it harder to be successful because of well, that loss of friction. You know, write that down and put it up on a bulletin board. It, you know, we think, you know, the, the, the politicians thought if you make it cheaper and easier and more transparent, it makes it better. It has not. It has not. I, I would argue it has not made it better. Maybe for the one-tenth of one percent smart people that are running the machine. And if you read... Simmons book on Renaissance capital. What is it from the man that solved the market or whatever it was? I mean, these are PhD mathematician. And you know, when people say I, I can speculate, I go, yeah, <laughs> let, me show, let me show you the CV of people that actually do this for a living and make a lot of money. You're not even close <laughs> to, to what this is. You know, that's a totally different breed. Yeah. So, um, other than it sounds like we're talking about the, uh, the next thing I wanted to ask, which is it. There are a lot of people, I think there are some individual investors who try to mimic what Buffett does, but they do it in a way where they just look at their 13F and go buy yeah. what he bought and who knows when he bought it or what price he paid and all that stuff. But I'm curious, you know, for just the average listener to this podcast, um, what are the most tangible two or three lessons that any retail investor can learn from Buffett beyond just everything we just talked about in terms of, you know, being patient and be, being willing to get rich slowly. Yeah. Well, it, if you would have said to me, 
you've got one thing to look at at a company. And there's just one thing, only one variable, one thing I would do, if not return on equity, return on invested capital. Tell me what that is. Tell me what that was last year. Tell me what it is this year. Tell me what it is the next year, the third year, fourth year, fifth year. If I could look at one thing to say, am I in a good business or am I in a bad business? I would look at what the company earns each and every year based upon its capital employed. If it's going in the right direction and upward sloping, that's all. Because then you know you got a good business. You know you've got good management. Right. And oftentimes you really don't have to buy you buy those companies at a steep discount. If it's a great company compounding at a high rate of return, you can buy, buy it at fair value, if not even slightly above fair value and do well over time. I would say, just look at return on equity. The return on e equity has been good. I would say, look, last couple of years, look at it, where is today? And then you can look at, you know, different, uh, research services and what is the, uh, uh, expectation for return on equity in the years ahead. If that's above 15%. Say the cost of capital is 10%, that's your rate of return in the market. But if you found companies that are generating returns at 15% or better on capital, that, 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 that gets you a long way down the road. Now, the question is, how long can you do that? And there's the part side of it, right? And try to figure out. And I was lucky to work with a guy named Bill Miller at Lake Mason. I ran the growth fund for Bill Miller for 14 years. The only guy that beat the market for 15 years in a row. He was a philosophy uh, PhD. Uh, dissertation, absent PhD, uh, lived on William James pragmatism. And he was the first value investor to ever figure out technology and value technology. And, and he spent all his time figuring out technology is where we need to be going. We just got to figure out one, how to value it and how is it sustainable? How can they do this over time? And, and that's the trick now in AI, right? Where's the, where's the sustainability of these returns over time? And if he figured that out, uh, boy, you can get a long way down the runway, uh, just on that. Yeah. That, I really like, I like the idea of, I mean, I know it's never this simple, but I do like the idea of having, if you could only look at one thing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I like that. So I want to, I want to pivot back a little bit and talk about two things that are sort of related and, and it touches back on two things we talked about. So obviously Charlie Munger passed, uh, this year, early this year and, or late last year. I forget exactly what it was now. November, yeah. November, November right? Okay. Uh -huh. End of November. That's right, because he would have been 100 on, what, yeah. January 1st or, or yeah. New Year's Eve yeah. or something? November um, 23rd, yeah. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts on, with Buffett running Berkshire in the absence of Charlie, if you have any sense of whether or not that changes his calculus of how long he wants to, to stay at the helm of the company. And then sort of tied to that, what do you think a post-Buffett Berkshire looks yeah. like when, whenever that happens? Well, you know, knowing how competitive Warren is, he'll want to run Berkshire one day longer than Charlie did. Oh, but he's not, but he's not going to give up the ship yet. You know, <laughs> when it becomes November 24th of one for in seven more years, you know, what maybe we'll have to start to worry about it. I mean, he, from everything that I gather, uh, you know, he just loves every day. And now, he, you know, people say to me, you know, when you're 90 years old, you're not hitting on all cylinders with equal force 12 hours a day, but he's still got it. He, I thought the last annual meeting, uh, he was really back on par and, and doing a great job. There was a time where Charlie seemed to have a little bit more energy to Warren, but Warren has, 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 has really pumped up. People that know him more than I do said so the energy's there, the enthusiasm's there, the want is there. So, I, you know, God willing, you know, health and everything, uh, he's not going anywhere for a while. And, and I bet you he's saying, I'll, I'll make it one more day than Charlie did. So I'm not worried about this year, next year. We already know the posts. Um, world is uh, Greg Abel, who seems more than uh, capable. He's running the largest number of people, not the largest amount of money when you consider what uh, Ajit Jan does at National Indemnity. Ajit is a little bit older than Greg, but Joe Brandon, who came over on the Allegheny deal, uh, mm -hmm. Joe Brandon actually worked at Jen Reed, and that was a mess, and left, and then started Allegheny, and Warren hired him. I think it's the only second time that Warren has ever hired somebody twice. The first was actually Rose Blumpkin. He hired Rose Blumpkin, or he fought Rose Blumpkin to Vassar Birchmark. She got in an argument with her sons, quit, went across the street and started a carpet company that was so good that Warren had to buy that company. So he just <laughs> hired Rose twice. <laughs> Joe Brunnen will go down in history as the second person that he hired twice, or the second person that he has hired more than once. And uh, Joe will be the backup to Aji. So those two parts are in, are in place. Yeah. Then it's Todd Wexler and Ted Combs who've done a pretty good job, you know, of the portfolios. And and it, it said, I don't know if this is to be true, but it said it was probably 
Apple was probably tenth pick in, in, in 2016, but you know certainly Warren pushed the pedal down in 2018-19, and when he made when he bet 35 billion, it was now Warren stock, not not Ted stock. So those are good stock pickers. You can see maybe the bench gets enlarged over the years, but you know I, I, the wheels won't come off the wagon. And, and as so many people said, it's the culture there is so great, decentralized, so you don't really need to have anybody at the helm, you just have to have, you know, good organ. let everybody run their own business and send the money upstream. Greg will allocate it, Ajit will allocate it, Ted and Todd will allocate it. And they'll do a above average job. Maybe not as great as Warren or not as great as Charlie, but they'll do an above average job. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, I think the, there's no reason why the company can't continue to do, you know, I said in the book, I said, what's phenomenal about Berkshire Hathaway is that, you know, it could conceivably you know, live on for another 50 to 100 years, surpassing every company, because basically it's not dependent upon technology. It's not dependent upon a pharmaceutical. It's not dependent upon anything except compounding your compounding. That's all it does. It just allocates capital. And as long as there's capital to allocate and they don't flush the money down the toilet, there's no reason why Berkshire wouldn't be around 50 years from now. Yeah. It's always struck me that what I most appreciate about Warren Buffett is his ability to change when the facts change, but still remain remarkably consistent. Yeah. Yeah. I've said that when we've talked about um, Buffett before that it's not like he decided how he was going to be in 1955 and never changed. If, he, yeah. if that had been the case, he wouldn't have bought Apple or allowed anyone yeah. to pitch Apple to him. Yeah. Um, but even with that ability to change over time, there's been this remarkable consistency. And I, I like hearing you talk through the bench, so to speak, in the future. It sounds like. We, 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 we maybe not see any drastic change because it's a group of people that have that same skill set of being able to stay mostly yeah. consistent, but still changing when the facts change. Yeah. And it's got a great board. Uh, you got to remember, there's some really talented people on the board. Howard, his son, will become chairman of the board, non-executive chairman. And his job will be to, to see that the culture remains and the culture is sustained. So there's nobody that has a different agenda than what Warren does. They all want to just keep doing what Warren uh, you know, laid out. And it's interesting you say about, you know, with stocks, it's, it, he said, you know, one time about the tenants, he says they're principles. And you know, funny thing about principles, they last a long time. That's why they're called principles. <laughs> you don't have to go around changing them. And I think, you know, I would say I could have called it the Warren Buffett investment principles. That would have been fine. But I think my editor said, why don't we call it the investment tenants? But it's yeah. the same thing. Tenants are principles and principles are long lasting. So, you know, if you follow those tenants, which are Warren's tenants, they're not mine, they're Warren's. It would keep you in the arena of some good ideas that's going to increase your batting average over time. Robert, one last question. Yeah. When is the 30th anniversary edition coming off the presses? Pop date, April 23rd. You can pre-order at Amazon. Thank you for the plug. Um, the book will be in Omaha. Uh, I, I have heard that the, the, the central book this year, and deservedly so, deservedly so, will be Charlie's Almanac. And yeah. Right. This New edition that just came out right, yeah, right after he died. It's going to be, it's, I've, I've already gone through the, uh, uh, the Kindle. You can't find it because I think all the copies have gone to Omaha. Yeah. Warren has, has said that this will be the central book this year and justifiably so. It's going to be Charlie centric, but it's going to be a celebration as, as Warren would say, you know, Charlie would have it another, no other way, but it's going to be very Charlie centric. I'm looking forward to it and uh, I can't wait to get to Omaha, but thanks for, thanks for the plug. And guys, you, just make it so much fun to spend an hour. This this went much faster than I thought it would. Thank you. Well, likewise, Robert. It was great having you on. Good. This is awesome. Yes. Again, Robert Hagstrom. I don't think we've said it. Chief Investment Officer at Equity uh, Equity Compass, right? Yep. Exactly right. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. Robert, hopefully we'll have you on again. Look forward to it. Jeff, Jason, thanks so much. I enjoyed it. Good luck to you. Thank you. Jeff, we did it. We did it. As always, just a reminder, we love to give our answers to these hard investing questions. Have great guests like Robert Hagstrom to share their insights and their opinions. But it is up to you to answer these questions for yourself. But as always, I believe in you. You can do it. All right, Jeff, we'll see you next time. See you next time.